Uh, there. Okay. So um we got that all set up. We got a couple more people coming in. I love you, Diane, but I'm muting you. I am muting Jim because we're getting rolling and we don't want any noise in the background. We're probably gonna have more people come in some people uh sign up but but can't do it in real time so we'll have the, the recording for that so here we go all right welcome welcome everybody this is the potomac river jazz club's monthly jazz talk featuring mark bro Woo! really excited to have you mark this is this is fun thank um thank you we we uh we have been bringing traditional jazz to the dc area uh, in the way of live music and jams and things like that for 52 years now. And wow. we started hosting these jazz talks during the pandemic shutdown as a way to get money to musicians who couldn't work and uh, have had such a great time doing it. We've gotten presentations by music historians. We've gotten uh, musicians who just tell us about who they are. We've gotten all kinds of things, you know, all, all, all tangents of, of early jazz. And uh, we like learning, we like, uh, like meeting new people. And so, uh, so you, are, you are very welcomed and in good company. Great, thank you. Um, so we all know that traditional jazz, I mean, the roots come out of an evolution of lots of different kinds of music. I mean, we've got uh, the European classical music changing to dance hall music. We've got African and Caribbean uh, uh, drums and chanting and, and this wonderful blend of all of these cultures that have come together to make this absolutely fabulous music. Um, and uh, if anybody, if any of y'all are in New Orleans, um, if you have not been to the Jazz Museum lately, they had a new exhibit open this past weekend focused on Congo Square. And there's some piggybacking on their drums bill exhibit that has been in there. And it kind of uh, follows through into the drumming at Congo Square and then into how Congo Square has influenced early jazz. So I'm just gonna throw a little, a little shout out to that uh to that exhibit into things but um uh, mark you and your family are like a a legacy family in the melding of cultures you've got the brunius family and the santiago family blend you've got the the bro side you've got all this coming together um and uh we're gonna learn a lot more about you but let me turn it over to you a little bit and tell me Maybe tell me a little about your influences and, and some of that, that early jazz, uh, you know, B Buddy Bold and Jelly Roll Kid or, you know, is there anybody that's a standout that really, that has really pushed you in your career? Uh, I might have to, I may have to move locations because my, um, my computer's freezing, but can you ask that question again? What was yeah, it? yeah, sure. I just saw that fr freeze on you. Yeah, you just uh, what? What are your influences? I mean, you're you're a vocalist and trumpeter. You're you're out there. We'll talk more about what you're doing in your career. But um, what are what are some of the the influences from those from those early jazz players that, well, that have course, pushed growing, you? Yeah. yeah, of course. Growing up in New Orleans, um, I'm a big fan of music. I mean. Everybody here loves music, and and music is just a part of the the is, is a huge part of our culture. You know, it's uh, it's really the thing that brings everyone together. And so, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of all kinds of reasons to have music in New Orleans, right? Like, I mean, even funerals, birthday parties, um, weddings. I mean, there's 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 music all around around us, you know, and, uh, you know, we have second lines here, which are free to the public, you know, just music for the sake of bringing the community together. So, um, and then growing up in a musical family, I was around music all the time. And um, of course, you know, my my parents uh, would, would bring us out to hear music, live music uh, every weekend at least. Uh, because my uncles were always playing around town somewhere. My grandfather um, passed away when I was 
almost three and I have some memories of him, but I never really got to know him personally as a musician, but my uncles, it's a, you know, it's a different story. So they were a really huge influence on me. And, um, you know, before I, before I played the trumpet, I always wanted to be involved in music in some kind of way. So I was singing before I started playing. I, I would sing and at one point I wanted to DJ. I, uh, you know, I, I DJed a, a party when I was about 12 and I, that th that was it for that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I wanted to do that. And, um, I, and around that time, uh, so my brother, my brother was playing, he's uh, uh, three years older than me and he was playing trumpet and we always had trumpets around because I came from a trumpet playing family. So my, my mom is, um, one of eight siblings of my grandparents and they all played trumpet. My grandfather played trumpet. And so my uncle Wendell, he, you know, he and my mom uh, are really close. And so, you know, he gave my brother a couple of cornets. So that meant, you know, there was one around for me to mess, mess around with. So I was uh, messing around with the cornet. Then when I was about 12, around the time when I was getting into DJing, my uncle gave me a horn and, uh, and I joined the school band. And uh, I was always hanging hanging around with, with him. And so I got to meet a lot of New Orleans musicians before I was on the scene playing. I knew a lot of people. And they all, you know, I didn't know what type of uh, impact listening to them was going to have on me or how much of an influence uh, they, were, they were going to be. But it's been a tremendous blessing to have all of these musicians and mentors in my life um so you know one of my main influences was my grandfather uh, but you know i only know know him through rec records pretty much um but and just in case some of the other folks don't know when he's re referencing his grandfather you're talking about john brunius and one of the things he was uh you know one of the many things he was known for was many the moocher Right. He did um, yeah. like that, that, that uh, great arrangement, too. And um, and uh, your uncle Wendell, Wendell Brunius, who is now the musical director at Preservation Hall. So just giving some people a little context. And then a lot a, a lot of people uh, think that John Jr. Was, was my grandfather, but he was my uncle. So he played trumpet, too. He just has the same name as my grandfather. Right. Um, but he was my he was my godfather. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, my, you know, my, my uncles had a, had a tremendous uh, influence and, in, you know, just being around uh, Wendell a lot because he was a lot closer in, in age to me than John was. So I would, you know, I would hang out with him a lot more and uh, and he just knew everybody and he, you know, he knew so many things and I would just learn from him and, uh, you know, just just kind of witness what was going on on the scene um you know how guys interacted on the bandstand how they dressed uh everybody was always clean it was you know so that was great to see coming up and you know and I now I you know present myself in that way and I always believed in presenting myself that way because they you know would always present themselves in such a uh professional manner and just dress nicely and you know. I think it's that's very important for for young people, you know, men, you know, boys and girls, but but to have mentors, to have role models to look up to, um, and uh, and particularly in in the in the New Orleans musical culture, you know, if you're, um, you know, you, you, I, I I could just see myself, you know, when I was thirteen and playing woodwinds and going. Oh, I'm gonna be in a band, you know, and just think I could just show up and play something I was in or something, you know. I could just, I could just see, uh, you know, if, from the immature outlook and for not being wise, you know, uh, that I, I would think I knew enough to, to, to know it all and to, to be able to experience these professional musicians and the way they carry themselves and the way they play and all that would be just invaluable. Yeah, and I never realized like how, how many mentors I was going to have out of just playing music because really everybody you know uh 
or a lot of the people who I came across were very nurturing and they were patient and they would show me things and, and teach me. And um, so, I mean, at, at a certain point, it wasn't just my family. It was, it was a, it was like an extended family. And, uh, and that just grows and grows over the years. You know, I mean, being around, you know, Freddie Lonzo and Bob French and uh, Leroy Jones. Looks like it froze up again. You know, it's, and I don't, I don't want to leave uh, uh, Clarence Ford. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I, I try to explain sometimes to people who, who maybe are not as familiar with New Orleans, you know, the city or the culture, that it really is a small town in a way, you know, that, that, um, and, and even the musicians who are known for, for doing trad jazz, you'll find them in other, um, other genres, playing with other groups, you know, reaching out, like you said, you know, you start, you know aspirations of, of being a DJ when you were younger, you know, that kind of thing. Like you can go a lot of different ways with the music and, and, and there's a, there are so many musicians who uh, work with each other and support each other and respect each other and help each other and all that. It, it really feels almost like a small town sometimes to me. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, really every, um, everyone is really close knit and uh, it's also made an impact on me as a mentor. Cause now I'm a mentor to some younger musicians and that's really important to me. And it's, a, you know, like um, doing um, children's programs, educational things. I always want to make sure that the kids leave with something that they can hold on. To for the rest of just, um, just uh, being inspired can sometimes affect different as aspects of their lives, you know, that was, become that, fans, you know. That, yes, that was one of my notes is how um, you seem to be very focused on education and mentorship. Um, I know um, I play in this uh, little community street band back here in Maryland. And um, we were looking for arrangements of a couple of the traditional jazz tunes. And I stumbled across the ones on Prez Hall's website. And, um, awesome. cool. and I'm like, hey, Mark did these. And then I'm like cursing you because of course, alto is not traditionally used and I play alto. So then I had to like transcribe all my stuff, you know, change it all into my key. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> but, I saw that, and then we'll, we'll get to your your Living the Tradition album a little later. But I, you've got music posted for that as a resource, and and you've done. I've seen some videos you've done for Prez Hall on you know different topics related to to trad jazz as outreach and and such. So I think it's fabulous that you're you're then sharing that knowledge with the next generation. Yeah, and you know, uh, I mean, if if you know, if we don't put it out there, you know, as we're, as we're getting older and the older generation is passing on and, you know, it's, I mean, we have to keep that information out there. We, you know, we can't, we, we can't lose it, the, uh, you know, cause a lot of the things uh, can't be learned from a book, you know, so we have to pass on our knowledge. There may be some, I may be with a student, there may be something that I think of, I've never written it down. I've never, you know, and that's kind of how I learned from, you know, like an oral tradition. It's, um, so, you know, I, I think it's uh, important that we just keep information out there for, uh, for the next generation who wants to play music to be inspired by. You know. Absolutely, so important. So, so we can picture you uh, in the home. You've got all these family members playing trumpets and other things around you. Um, and uh, and so so you went into you went into you're in school. And then I read somewhere that um, you went on a European tour with UNO when you were at university. Um, was that your first like big tour thing that you did? Yes. That was the first big tour. That, that was my first time going to Europe. And, um, you know, I, I didn't mention that 
um, you know, at family functions too, we always had music. We had so many people who participated in music, even people who are not full-time musicians. So like, you know, I get to, you know, go to my grandparents' house and my uncle, you know, my younger uncle, he's passed away now, but he played trumpet and bass drum and he was a grand marshal. His name was Burnell. And I would just go over and I could just take out my trumpet and we'd jam with, you know, put on some uh, Olympia brass band records and just jam, you know, or if there was a family function, somebody may bring a tuba and somebody might have a, a bass drum and then, you know, there'll be a big jam session at, at a family function. So I got kind of, you know, got my feet wet with, uh, with family functions, you know, and that, I think that really helped, you know, not to be terrified to get out there and go play, you know, I, I felt a, a little more comfortable, but yeah, I, I, um, so I went to uh, UNO and we did a European tour for, a, it was about a month long tour. And we, it, but it wasn't, uh, we weren't playing traditional New Orleans jazz. It was, it was more straight ahead stuff. We were playing, you know, some, some Wayne Shorter music and Joe Henderson, um, or some originals that some of the guys in the band had, had written. And um, it was funny because we got over there and we're playing all these really slick, you know, kind of modern jazz tunes, if you want to call, call them. And a New Orleans band? Why aren't you playing New Orleans music? You know, so we had to we had to break out some of that stuff to, uh, uh, when we were there. But yeah, it, it was that tour um, wasn't really about uh, playing New Orleans music. But we had a lot of fun, and I, I and I learned a lot. With, I, it was a great group of musicians. Um, many you know are are still playing today. One one has uh, since passed away, but. Um, yeah, some some really great musicians in that in that combo, and uh, I really value that time at UNO because just a, a lot of uh, excellent musicians were rolling through there at the time. Uh, you know, Ellis Marsalis was still there, and um, Victor Goins, Ed Peterson was there at one point, and Steve Masakowski. So um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So. Um... So I know, I mean, anybody who uh, pulls up your bio can see a laundry list of, of who, who you've played with. And that's probably 5% of who you've played with, if that, right? I mean, you played, uh, and we've had him as a speaker, you played with Dr. White's group. Um, you've played with Henry Butler, um, Eddie Bow, Treme Brass Band, um, Harry Connick Jr.'s band. And you've, you've had quite a history of various things you've done with Harry. Um, you, as I remember, you were on his TV show and, and, um, and, you know, have, have done various things with him. Did all that bec come before uh, becoming a um, member of Preservation Hall? Yes, I was a member of Harry's band before Preservation Hall. Mm -hmm. um, so I joined Harry in 2001. And then um, I joined the well, I was playing at Preservation Hall, but I wasn't touring with the band. And then um, when my uncle John passed away, he was leading the band at the time. That was in 2008. And uh, that's when I started touring with the band after after John passed away. And um, yeah, and I'm, and I'm still touring with Harry. So, but... Yeah, I, I mean, I was uh, actually playing with both bands at one time, and that was a that was a period, a long period when I was uh, wasn't home a whole lot. Right, tour, touring with but the touring band, like, right? I mean, yeah, and, and Preservation Hall was touring like crazy. You know? <laughs> yeah, we were out a lot. Yeah, because I, I I know I know sometimes those hall stints are short, but you can go out real you can be out there for a long time or for a lot of short ones where you're just in right. out in yeah. in out right. Yeah. Um. So um, you know, like everybody knows the legacy of the hall. I mean that that's big, and being an ambassador or face of Preservation Hall is is a big responsibility in a way. 
Um, I mean, not not that playing in other bands isn't, but there is a, a certain, um, uh, you know, people look at you as an ambassador to really to the whole world of, of New Orleans jazz. Um, and uh, did you did you feel um, did you feel the, the weight of that responsibility when you stepped in? Oh. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, um, I had a whole new respect for that uh, responsibility and, and that uh, um, just, you know, kind of, um, I don't, I don't want to say I was the, the face of it, but I mean, I was doing a lot of interviews. I was, you know, and, and I, I saw my, um, I saw my uncles do that and they made it look easy, you know? So uh, if you, if you see any interviews with me that I did with, when I was with uh, touring with the preservation hall band, I'm just trying to make it look easy, <laughs> but I'm like, you know, those kinds of interviews you, you, you're constantly thinking. And I mean, people are throwing questions at you and um, you know, when, you know, when you're new, it got easier as time went on, but it was a you know it was a lot of responsibility and uh, in that position, and um, you know have no regrets. So. Yeah, yeah, good, good. I um, uh, so so for folks that are are not familiar, uh, Mark, you're at the hall Mondays, right, with the brass. Brass band. Mondays with the, yeah, Mondays with the brass, and then uh, Fridays with uh, my band, which you know is like a sit-down band with piano and bass. And, right. Yeah. And yeah. 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 Um. And um. And and not everybody may realize this, but there are there's the the actual hall when you go to the physical hall in person. There are a lot of versions of the Preservation Hall jazz band there. Each night is a different band leader and. Uh, you know, you'll see some players on more than one night, but but there are a variety of band leaders, all of it's traditional jazz, but they're very slight differences in flavors. Can you maybe describe a little of those differences for folks? Yeah. So um, the brass band. You know, we'll go in uh, some different directions as far as like traditional. It, I mean, we that band has a vast repertoire and and um and we go in a lot of different directions so it could be really traditional like a rag ragtime piece or something from the era of the the, the revival period the, you know the 60s or you know we, we might play something you know uh more modern or something you know from or more recent you know like a dirt, dirty dozen song or something like that so but it's all it's all new orleans stuff and uh, we, we, you know, we do some originals, um, and then uh, so, so actually, the Preservation Hall Jazz Band plays on Tuesday nights, and it's the band that that tours um, with uh, so Brandon Lewis, the trumpet player, he's uh, leading that band now, and um, so and sometimes sometimes when when Brandon's out of town, out. I'll lead the band uh, on Tuesday nights, but uh, you know they're playing a lot of traditional things now, and I think they may play some of the stuff from more uh, recent albums that's not really traditional New Orleans jazz. Um, and then on Wednesdays, I know Brandon leads a group there with some of the elders like Ricky Monet and. Um, uh, Let's see. So I can't remember who else is in that band, but and I think they play a lot of uh, traditional things. Um, Thursdays, my uncle Wendell uh, plays there. He plays a lot of uh, uh, traditional New Orleans songs, and he has a really vast repertoire. Like I mean, I, he may know more songs than anybody in the entire city, or you know he. <laughs> He may know more songs than a lot of people in the world, so you know I um, I don't get to go hear him all the time. But when I do hear him, it's always quite impressive. Uh, some of the things that he pulls out of the hat, I'm like, oh, I never heard that one. So I, I I'm still learning from him. 
Um, then on Friday nights, uh, I'm leading the band, um, and uh, we play a lot of traditional New Orleans stuff. And then I like to play some New Orleans R&B songs also, and Mardi Gras songs. And also I, I do a lot of original material uh, on Friday nights. And uh, let's see, Saturday, Saturday is a Shannon Powell. And um, I play I play with him sometimes, but um, I'm not regularly in his band anymore. I was at one time. And, um, you know, Shannon does a lot of traditional stuff on his on, uh, on those nights. I don't, the, the night I know the least about is Sundays because I'm always at the Palm Court on Sunday nights. So right. <laughs> I don't get to go check out other things. Yeah, yeah, I've caught you, caught you at Palm Court a few times on Sundays. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and it is, and each night is traditional, but each night does have its flavor of other things sort of sprinkled into them. And, and that does make it interesting. You can go and on three different nights and sure you'll hear a few duplicate songs, but it's not like you're going to hear the same 10 songs over and over again when you go. So I think right. that, that makes it more interesting for people to know that. Yeah. And the great um, thing is that it's always, no matter if you hear the same song, it's always going to be different. Someone's going to have a different arrangement or a different interpretation of, of the song. And, you know, um, like, uh, I never, I, I never really tire of playing any song because really if, if there's a song, I, I was talking to a friend of mine about that the other day and, I was, and uh, he was asking, um, uh, or I, I think I asked him, what do you, what's the song you think you've played the most in your life? And I forgot, uh, I think he turned the question back around on me. And <laughs> I said, it's probably when the Saints go marching in. And then number two is Bourbon Street Parade. <laughs> but I don't get tired of playing those songs because it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge every time. It's more of a challenge because every time I have to, you know, make it mean something to me, make it fresh and make it mean something to the audience. And I love, you know, I, I, I love doing that. So, you know, just maybe on the spot, you know, uh, we may do something very different to, to one of those songs, you know. Um, I get that. I get that. It'd be, you'd have to make it a little bit fresh here and there to, to keep it a little interesting. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> but it, I mean, it's, you know, it's always interesting when I go to hear other people, you know, if, if I'm just a spectator to hear their interpretation of, you know, some common songs that we may do. So, um, you know, I just, uh, and then you know, not only that, but besides the melody, everything else is always uh, improvised. Everything around, you, you know, the trombone is imp improvised and the clarinet, the piano player may play some different harmonies or, you know, and, and the bass player might follow suit and then, the, the, you know, the drums might go into a different groove. So you just kind of never never know what's going to happen. Um, and you just kind of try to keep it fresh that way. Cool. So um, I want to come back around a little bit to influences again. Um, uh, and you kind of hit on this, but I just wanted to see if there was any any standout musicians right now that are still influencing you. You know, we, we, we always think, oh, you know, when I get to be a certain age and I've done this for a certain amount of time, you know, I'm the master, but we are always learning, you know, no matter what we do, we always learn. I know you said, uh, you know, you learn from Wendell. Are there any other um, musicians that stand out as current mentors to you? Oh, this signal freeze for him. Oh, there we go, unfroze. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So, so are there any current mentors aside from Wendell? Like, are there any standout mentors to you? Oh, yeah. Of course. Um, I mean, Charlie Gabriel, um, Freddie Lonzo. I love Freddie. I love Charlie too. <laughs> yeah, Ricky Monet, Leroy Jones. Um, you know, uh, wow. Oh, yeah, Steve Pistorius. Um. Steve's a character. I like Steve. Orange, Orange Kellen has had a tremendous impact on me. You know, I, I love, I, I've learned so much from Orange and Steve and, uh, and Michael White being in Michael White's band for years. Um, I mean, 
you know, he, he was all, Michael was always doing something like different kinds of projects. And it, so it was always interesting. You know, we, uh, we did a few tours where we did all Sidney Bechet music. We did uh, uh, some tours where we, or uh, uh, I can't remember if this was a tour, but we, we did like all the hot fives and hot sevens, Louis Armstrong um, uh, repertoire. And uh, so I, I learned a lot. Um, I remember for those things, uh, just learning all of Louis Armstrong's. Solos. And I was like, man, I can't, I can't play anything but what Louis Armstrong played because anything else is gonna sound, you know, like not even close in comparison. <laughs> so I just learned all the Louis Armstrong solos and I played them verbatim, you know. And wow. I don't know. I might I may have uh or at least I tried. And uh and so I don't I don't know how I would um I haven't done a, a project like that in a while. So I, I probably would have a, a very different approach and you know put more of my put more of myself into it. But I mean that I know that's getting away from your question so but you know michael white was uh or is a um is a big influence and you know he he writes a lot of original songs which is you know i i love that i love that you know people are still pumping new original ideas into such a tradition um so you know michael's doing that i start i started writing a bunch of songs uh my last record was just all original songs tim Laughlin. Uh, he writes a lot of uh, original, so that you know that's in, in, uh, inspiring to me in a in a different kind of way. Um, I love that you went that way because next up was me asking about living the tradition. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> perfect segue. Perfect segue. Um, See, got you up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, little freeze again. Sorry, y'all. Technology. <laughs> There we go. I'm sorry. Right. I was frozen for a second. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. I, I I waited until it was unfrozen. So um, so uh, so your album "Living the Tradition." What year did that come out? That was in 2018. 2018, fabulous album, by the Thank way, you. absolutely fabulous. And um, and as it says, I mean, you do live the tra tradition. You were born in the tradition. You work in the tradition. You you know, you embody the spirit of the New Orleans music tradition. And then you put together this fabulous and wrote this fabulous album that sounds very traditional. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very traditional. Um, I have it pulled up so that I can play a little bit of it. Um, is there a song that uh, of the list that I should maybe hit first? I will say that um, maybe one of the most requested songs from that record is Palm Sunday because a lot of people come to Palm Court on Sundays and you know they want to hear so maybe Palm Sunday. All right, I'm going to I'm going to play a little bit of that. I think. There we go. Can you hear it all right? Yeah. Yeah, um, so I think it's breaking up because um, do you have um, original sound for musicians on? I do, but this is coming out of speakers, but oh. I'll, I'll, I'll send them a link so they can they can get a little bit more to it. But okay. um, but you, you've got that under that you've got that Latin tinge we talk about uh, in, in New Orleans music. Could you talk a little bit about that flavor? Yeah, so um, I wrote that song shortly after I came back from Cuba. And I think that some of those influences um, came from my, you know, or that influence, the influence for that song came from 
my uh, my trip to Cuba. Um, and, um, you know, I, I started writing that one and it, it, it really just wrote itself. Like, you know, <laughs> it doesn't always happen like that, but that one, that one did. Um, and, and a lot of, uh, songs people might be familiar with when we, when I said that word Latin tinge, there's that, that, uh, it's really that clave rhythm kind of underneath things, right? That bump, 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 kind of an underneath yes. that 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 fuels a lot of the older uh, traditional piano music and 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 falls behind, you know, in, in a lot of a lot of the the songs that we hear and um and, and from New Orleans and one of those uh, things that makes you go, oh, that sounds like New Orleans, right? Absolutely, <laughs> and and I mean that that clave is the underlying rhythm of New Orleans traditional drumming. That cut you can it's not played exactly like that, but you can hear that clave under the um you know in under that uh basic you know New Orleans little bit of you know that Yes the that street time. street beat feel. Right. Oh, or boom boom you know, so you can kind of hear that, that clave under, I mean, really that's the basis of, uh, of it. Yes. Um, let's try one more song. Maybe it'll come through a little better. Um, pick another one on your list. Uh, so one with a little different flavor is Trouble. That's uh, okay. I've, and that's featuring uh, Gerald French. Is that any better? We've got that kind of a little more of a slightly more modern feel, you know, in, in the realm of New Orleans music, a little bit of the sort of uh, R&B feel, gospel feel to uh, it, yeah. which I love. I love that's one of the things I like about this album is like each each song you're like, oh, that's got that flavor to it. Oh, that's got that flavor to it. And it's wonderful variety. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, it's like, you know, um, with the different bands I grew up playing in, there wasn't a huge difference in, uh, you know, what, what, what we would do on certain gigs, you know, like um, playing with, uh, I was in both Bob French and George French's bands and we would play, you know, stuff from the Motown era all the way back to Jelly Roll Morton. It, you know, it, it didn't, it didn't matter. It was just all music. And it all had an influence on you know on my writing and, and playing. Um, I mean, I didn't do anything like that. All, all of the stuff on living the tradition is it has a connection to New Orleans. But I was just saying, like, I remember I was I was on a gig. Um, I had just joined the Preservation Hall band, and I was on a gig with. Uh, this is a separate gig. I was on a gig with Ellis Marcellus, and we were we were talking on a on a break, and. Um, a lady came up and said, uh, well, aren't you, um, aren't you young to be playing, you know, the, the traditional, because I was in my early thirties and, uh, it was something about playing what we were playing that night and, 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 you know, maybe like trying to differentiate it from New Orleans traditional jazz. And I'll never forget what Ellis told the lady. I, I didn't get a chance to answer and Ellis said, it's all the same to us, you know, <laughs> and it's so, it's so, you know, there's some uh, records that Bob French put out with Ellis playing piano on it. And, um, and it's so swinging. It's not, it doesn't sound like Lester Santiago or Jeanette Kimball. It sounds really, you know, it sounds really, Ellis is playing Ellis, but it fits right in with the traditional, 
with the traditional style. You know, it just it just sounds good. And I think as long as it sounds good, I think that you know, I think that's what what counts to me. Um, but yeah, so you know, there's a I, I I didn't have I didn't really have in mind I'm going to write a song like this. I'm going to write a song like that. I'm going to write a song like that. It was just uh, like like the record says, living the tradition, just expressing myself through the songs that that I was composing, you know. And uh, everyone came out a, a little different. If you uh, if you listen to um, uh, "You're the One," that's a more traditional. Yeah, I was thinking of of one either that or Toulouse is like a yeah, like a, yeah yeah. Um, let me let me throw a few seconds up of "You're the One" for folks. Ooh, loud. Yeah, that could have been written in the 20s or 30s. <laughs> um, as as well as it, as it could have been written in the in the 1920s or 1930s, just as it could have been written today. I mean, it really just it, it very much embodies that sound. Yeah, and you had quite a lineup on on your recording. Now, of course, you did. I mean, you're around these 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 cats all the time, right? Lucian, may he rest in power, Lucian Barbarin. You had Tim Laughlin, Herlin Riley. Um, you have Mark Brooks, Megan plays piano, right? And some some guest, uh, guest people who who uh, we've had at the Jazz Club. Cheryl French has come and done one of these with us. Uh, Ronell has played one of our special concerts with us. So uh, Roger Pollen. I mean, you, you really had quite quite a, a lineup of people. Um, and uh, I don't know. I, I read, was reading somewhere about how and it, it was. I don't think it was one of one of your things that I was looking at, but but specifically how quote unquote they make it look so easy to play this music, you know. But it's 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 it looks easy and feels easy because you're professionals. Because <laughs> you practice, because you've grown up playing with each other, and and you know, and and that that conversation that jazz is that's so different from so many other styles of music, where you're playing off of each other, yeah. you know, and, and and creating that conversation in the in the song that might only ever happen once because it's going to be a little different the next time, right? Yeah. Um, that, that's that's fabu fabulous. Um, any. Um, any moments you can think of about recording the album that stand out? Like any surprises that 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 came up when you were like, "Oh, that's not how I heard it in my head," but wow, this has just turned into something really amazing. <laughs> yeah, I you know, um, so the song "Trouble," I got so uh, wrapped up in that. So the the call and response was supposed to be, mm -hmm. and then the band, and then everyone else answers. Mm -hmm. But Gerald started going, whoa, and I thought it sounded good. I, I just, you know, I just left it like that and, and how he was feeling it. And so I, I you know, if, if, if it came across uh, good, you know, in, in a good way, if it came across in a good way and, and, um, and that's how, if that's how Gerald was feeling it. Um, I was like, okay, this is going to be the keeper, you know? And uh, it, it was so much fun making that song because Gerald sang his part. And then we all, I wish I had a video of this, but we all stood in a, stood in a circle. Uh, me and uh, Tim, Megan, Herlin, and and uh, I think Lucian and Ronell. And, uh, and Lucian and uh, Lucian and Herlin had a dance off while, while we were recording that. It was so, <laughs> It was so funny. I mean, some of the dances Lucian was doing, it was just hilarious, but so good, but just hilarious. I mean, he was, you know, he was known for clowning around and uh, that it was really fun uh, recording that song. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the musicians were, 
they 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 dug the music. They were you know they were liking the songs, and so everybody had uh, you, you know like they they wanted to be creative within this and uh, and and you know put their stamp on it. And I think everybody everyone just did a great job. And you know some of uh, the songs were written, but some of the arrangements were on you know on the spot. Yeah. So that was it was just. A lot of fun creating because I, I I've been in the studio many many times, but you know, playing either reading from a from a chart or you know playing someone else's music or old you know old old music that had been recorded before. But this was like a blank canvas, and I, this is my first time ever doing that. So um, you know, I, I I was really really proud of that record. That's fabulous. I I um. I, I got to know Lucian a little bit because um, he was in a, uh, the first time I met him, he was in a, a band that led the crew of Cork Parade, right? And oh, it looks like it froze up again. Going to give it a quick pause. Yep. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so Lucian used to be in, uh, actually, Freddie used to put a band together for the crew of Cork Parade every year. He, I think he, he may still even put the band together, although he doesn't walk in it anymore. But but Lucian would always walk in it and um, and I would always get as close to him as I could behind the band, like on his side, because he would clown around so much and just have, a, you know, like and, and there was just there, that's the one thing about the about uh, New Orleans, you know, music with the New Orleans sound is it really does bring joy out of you it makes you want to dance it makes you want to clown around it makes you want to enjoy life and uh and i would i would always get close to lucian because he, he always had a good time yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um so if you go to mark's website markbro.com not only is there a link to soundcloud with his album um but there is also sheet music to all all or almost all of the stuff on the album which i found amazing you got sheet music up of all your stuff. You got lead sheets. Yeah. So, I might I might be arranging a couple of these things for our street band, man. Oh, that would be awesome. You know, you just you I, just gave me you just gave me work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Without even knowing you were doing it, because um, we're we're looking for stuff that has a New Orleans sound that hasn't been done five thousand times. Um. Gosh, this technology freeze. Sorry, y'all. Yeah, yep. so, yeah we're always looking for music that's got that sound that hasn't been done by 5,000 bands 5,000 times, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, I mean, and, and uh, you know, the good thing is, is that I've been playing some of these, uh, you know, a, a lot of original. Some of them are not on that album, but, you know, um, uh, I've been able to play these songs with many different people. So now people are starting to know, you know, songs, um, you know, some original songs and I can play them on a gig because we can't always rehearse, you know, we can't always rehearse everything. But if, if we've played it, if they've played it before and I have enough people on the gig who, who, who know it, I mean, I, you know, uh, we can always play those songs. So right. it gives, gives us a chance to play um, more fresh material that people may not have heard yet. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I'm, I'm really, you know, we, we do some of it with the brass band and, you know, my band on Fridays and Sundays at the Palm Court. So, it's a, you know, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I, like, I like writing and I'm doing new songs. It's fabulous. It really is. So um, I, I did see that it's still on the Louisiana Music Factory's website. Is that the best way for them to get it? Or is there another place they should check out? That's the only place that has the... Um, the physical CD? Yeah, the physical CD. Ugh. But, uh, yeah, oh, I, just, I don't know. That just froze up a little bit. So you said iTunes also? Yeah, iTunes also, but yeah, definitely Louisiana Music Factory if you want a physical copy of it. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, so um, b being out and about, are there any other younger musicians, newer bands out that you think um, people should be paying attention to that maybe folks wouldn't have heard of up here? Um. 
You know, I like the rumble. The rumble? Yeah. I, have you heard of them? I have not. Yeah, they were nominated for a Grammy this year. They were one of the New Orleans bands nominated for a Grammy. Um, oh, wait a minute. Did I hear them? Is that a Sun Pie Sun? Sun Pie Sun, yeah. I have seen them. Yes, I have seen them. Yeah. yeah I, saw them, I saw them at Maple Leaf. They are good. Yeah, uh, there's, um, you know, there, I mean, there are some traditional uh, traditional bands too, like um, uh, the Palmetto Bug, Bug Stompers. They, you know, mm -hmm. um, with Washboard Chaz and uh, Tuba Skin cool. is another. I think is another one that's been pretty popular. They yeah, really, they sound really good. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the Nightcrawlers. I like the night crawlers. I you know, some of the uh I like a lot, you know, like some of the brass bands and some of the brass bands that have been around, like New Birth. Mm -hmm. know, love New Birth and of course Rebirth. Yep, yep. Yeah. So um kind of coming back around to the, the educational thing, I see that you do workshops for schools and things like that. And so can you um you know, I know, I know you do stuff with the hall and do stuff on your own, but, um, but uh, like, is your favorite thing playing? Is your favorite thing teaching? Do you have, you don't have to have a favorite thing, but. No, I, don't think I, I don't think I have a favorite. Um, I, I, you know, I love it all. And, uh, you know, and it's even more rewarding when I feel like, you know, with, with teaching that the kids have, have walked away with some knowledge and, um, uh, so, and that's a fine line you walk because you you don't want to oversaturate them with information because you know nobody's there writing these things down and you know and so my approach to it is I don't try to name a bunch of musicians you know if they're from uh, you know Wyoming or something they're not gonna know when I mention Percy Humphrey and Willie Humphrey and um, you know, George Lewis. And so I, you know, I'll throw a, a name out there, like, you know, like Sweet Emma or something like that, something that, that they can remember and hold on to and, and do a Sweet Emma song. <clears throat> and then that, that may, you know, spark some interest in, oh, let me look up this, this lady, Sweet Emma, because, you know, if I'm at Preservation Hall, there are portraits on the wall of Sweet Emma. And, uh, you know, I just think that makes for an interesting story. And I tell them a little bit about Sweet Emma and how she was the first band leader at Preservation Hall. And, uh, you know, I like uh, giving, you know, some information about jazz funerals and the, uh, and, um, you know, I did some lessons on, on, uh, on polyphony. And so, but I also, besides just, teaching I also like performing for for the kids and and and, and making it exciting for them and uh, because you know really listening is such an important part of of music if you're interested in playing music listening is more important probably than the act of actually doing you know doing it so um say like take traditional uh, New Orleans music, for example, you know, you have the front line and everybody's improvising at the same time. So you have to, you have to listen to each other, but not only do you have to listen to each other there, but you have to listen to what's been done before you listen to old recordings, listen to, you know, some records of people that, that you admire, because that's how you get the sound in your head to know how it's supposed to sound because any three people can get up in the front of a stage and start improvising together, but it's making it sound like it's, you know, like it's a cohesive thing. That's, that's the, uh, you know, that's the challenge of it. So I do, uh, I do emphasize uh, listening and, you know, that, like I said, I don't have a favorite. Uh, I love listening. I love playing, <laughs> teaching, writing, um, arranging. And uh, I just think it's, you know, it's it's all part of uh, it's all part of 
who you know who I am or who I want to be, what I want to do. So um, I just try to approach it with uh, as as much passion as I can muster, you know, <laughs> at all times. Well, you do it all. That's for sure. That's for sure. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Um, anybody have any uh, any questions from Mark? Unmuted. Um, hey, Joel. Hi. He doesn't recognize me. Hey, Joel. Without my hat. <laughs> he he finished a set on. To, to, to Friday at the at the uh, French Quarter Fest Thursday, I, I, and I nailed him at the gate, and right. I said, "We're going to be on Zoom together. I want to know what you're going to talk about." He, <laughs> I I don't know, but he, it's so, <laughs> uh, you have a week to do your homework. Um, uh, I've been pretty lucky in being able to meet uh, and know and been mentored by uh, some of the people who are. Uh, members of the long-standing New Orleans music families, uh, like Gerald French, um, uh, Joe Lasty, uh, Mark Brooks, uh, Ronell Johnson, uh, and and now you and Wendell. Um, how did I've always been curious about how these families came together? Not everybody, I assume, lived in the same neighborhood or maybe even went to the same school, prayed at the same church, you know, went to the same picnic. So how, uh, how Mark did these families get together? Was it just happened to be at a club at some social events? I'll turn it over to you. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the last, uh, I didn't get the end of that question. It froze. Uh, so, um, I'm, it was a long question. Then. <laughs> oh, right. So, my, I, I, the question was, how did the, the families that we know are culture bearers of New Orleans music today, how did they get together? They, as I said, they weren't in the same neighborhood, perhaps, same bands and, and same schools. What was, what was the unifying kind of thing that let you uh well wendell was your uncle uh -huh. um the frenches were another family uh and so forth how did they all get together so um you, you know the the families go way back i mean my my grandfather john brunies and papa french were uh were contemporaries they 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 both um you know, we're playing music together uh, way back, you know, of course, long before I was long before I was born. So I can't really say how they got together. But I mean, I think the common thread was uh, the uh, the desire to play this this music. Um, and then, uh, you know, I mean, it just continues from somehow from generation to generation. I was uh um, Wendell tells this story about how my grandfather had a gig book with Papa French and um, my grandfather couldn't make it so he said I'm going to send my son and he, he was expecting when, uh, my grandfather to send, send John Jr. but he sent Wendell who was pr pretty much a kid at that time and uh, so Papa French was like well, who are you? and he was like oh I'm Pickett's, I'm Pickett's son he's like oh I thought he was sending John you know, and um, so then, you know, generation to generation, it, uh, uh, you know, we were hanging around Tradition Hall when Tradition Hall was open all the time. Like I said, my parents took us out. And so Gerald was there. We were, Gerald and my brother are the same age. And, um, you know, I was three and four years old hanging around Tradition Hall. And then um, and then Gerald and I and, and my brother and I, we all uh, we all wound up going to high school together. And um, so I knew Gerald and I knew, and, and he was playing, um, he was playing professionally while we were in high school. And when he graduated, uh, you know, we just, uh, we kept in touch. I was a few years younger, but when I, um, and I was playing with a, a lot of kids in, in the brass bands and things. And, uh, and he, was, he was starting to play with the older musicians. 
So, um, so anyway, you know, I was telling Gerald, I said, man, I, I you know, I want to, I want to do some more playing plays, you know, play some more traditional things. And so he had a bunch of cassette tapes. This was before the CD, I think. I think it was before the CD. Yes. <laughs> but he had a bunch of cassette tapes and he just laid a bunch of cassette tapes on me. I, you know, and, uh, and I just started to learn everything from those. And um, so I wound up, you know, I wound up being in his band. We were from the same generation. And um, I don't know where that's, it, it, may, it may have stopped with us, actually. <laughs> I don't know. So, so, Mark, there really was kind of an in crowd. Um, uh, it was a big crowd. Uh, but it was, it was this, a center, not maybe not the center, but a center of uh, New Orleans music came out of these families just getting together. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I guess, too, there, you know, were uh, connectors, you know, like, I mean, um, so the Santiago family was uh, on my grandmother's side. Those were her those were her brothers, my grandmother's brothers, the Santiago's, and she was married to my grandfather, John Brunius. So, you know, my my mother and aunts and uncles, they had music on on both sides of their family. And, um, you know, I, and, and then uh, they were, um, my uncle Lester and my grandfather, they were in Paul Barberin's band together. So there's another connection there, the Barberin family, which is a huge, musical family so you know my uh my uncle john wound up playing with doing some gigs with paul barberin and then um you know further on down the line my uncles are playing with lucian and then i come up and then i'm now i'm playing with lucian you know lucian started hiring me when i was a, a kid and uh i think it just um i think it just snowballed i i don't know exactly how it happens but <laughs> That, so, that's my experience with so some guy comes down from kansas city and, and wants to play he's gonna have a hard time breaking in <laughs> oh not necessarily <laughs> not necessarily because you look at some of the musicians that we have who are uh staples in the community like i mean i don't know you take tom fisher you know tom fisher right he's been here yeah. for a long time but you know wh when he came here he became involved with New Orleans musicians who were actually part of this tradition. So what I find now is that there there are two two sets of people who come here who want to play. There are people who want to come and immerse themselves in in the in the tradition and what's been going on here for years. And then there are people who don't care who any of us are and they try to start their own scene. So I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's fine, but I'm just saying like, then they'll never be in with, you know, it, with part of the tradition. But, you know, people like Tom Fisher or do you take Orange Kellen and Lars Edegren? I mean, they've been here a lot long before I was born, but they came here to be part of the community that, that you know, that was creating this music. And, um, and, and some of the the younger players like Haruka as an example is a great example of that like she came here and she's you know uh she's become part of the the community of musicians who have been here their whole lives doing this and um so and you know I've talked to her about this uh uh many times and you know that's um that's what she, that's what she aspired to do you know she didn't she wasn't planning on coming here just to do her own thing. She wanted to be on stage and, and play play with the, you know, the people who she had heard and admired from afar at one time. I'll just throw one little thing in here and then I'm gonna step out and let somebody else ask a question. You mentioned two names, Steve Pistorius and Orange Kellen. I needed a place to stay during the festival. I called Pistorius and I stayed and he put me on to Kellen and I rented a room from Kellen. He said he was so he was my landlord. It's <laughs> okay. a market's a small world. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
That's, it's funny, Joel, when you said that you uh, cornered him after the set. I was there on Thursday for that set, too. And I was I was kind of back. I was sitting on the ground kind of toward uh, far, farther away from the stage. And I was going to break up there and just say hi to you, Mark. But I was like, you know what? I bet Joel's going to do it. <laughs> I got. I had to go to another stage. I'm. I'm I bet Joel will talk to him. I'll head somewhere else. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. Oh, well, I always, I always come say hello. I'm, I'm, I'm... <laughs> Any other questions? Anyone else from the audience? Questions, comments. Okay, about a minute. Um. Well, I always send around uh, a follow up, um, and I'll I'll put your website in it and put the Louisiana Factory uh, Music Factory link in for the uh, physical CD if people are interested in in having one in their in their little hands, and um, um, if there's anything else you can think of that that you want me to 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 put in there, I can I'm happy to to add that, but. One more call for questions. I see Jim. Jim has unmuted himself. You got a question, Jim? Uh, just a comment. Uh, I think Mark might also tell the n n new people in the his family that I'm are sorry, carrying Jim, on. Can you... Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. okay. I, hi, Mark. Hey, um, Jim. He uh, would we'll go back to his family a long time, but. Um, Mark, you might also say that you're carrying on a tradition because of your son, who is a musician. He started on trumpet, went to someone else, and you might say how that the Brunius family is continuing that tradition. Yeah. Um, so uh, my my son, he's he stopped playing. I don't know. You know, you can't force him to do it, and I don't want to. But uh, Wendell's son is Brandon is is playing, and uh, he's a good bass player and guitar player and banjo. Banjo play, player, and uh, now uh, Wendell's youngest son, Matthew, is is studying piano. So, um, so the Bruce family's continuing, is what I'm saying. Yes, and and I, I had to perf I had the opportunity to play. Not that I'm a trumpet player; I'd love to be a trumpet player, but I'm a, a person that holds a trumpet. You're a trumpet and, player, uh, Jim. Come on! <laughs> and, and, and I got the opportunity to play with his his son when he did play a trumpet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then he migrated. So, but but in the end, the, the Brunius name is still Wendell's and all the family is still growing uh, in, in the arts and the performing arts, and particularly this art kind of music. Yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, I mean, I have. I... <clears throat> I have grandkids now. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm cutting out. Well, Unfurs. You said you have grandkids now. Yeah. So. Um, I don't know, you know, they might be the next ones, and you know. You never know, your son might pick it back up too. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, he was he was a fine trumpet player. Yeah, right, he sure was. Yeah, and he, and then. Um, a nice tone. Yeah, he got bases, and then he switched to the bass. He started playing the electric bass. Ah. Yeah. Very cool. All right, last call for questions and comments. Make sure nobody else unmuted for anything. I have a question. Okay. Um, this is Sheila. Sheila I, speaking. Yes, I'm. I'm sorry. I missed most of the meeting. There will be a recording sent to the people who registered, right? Um. Yeah. As long as it's okay with Mark that I do that. Just double checking with you, Mark. Oh uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'll uh, I'll post a uh, post it for folks to be able to come back and, and take another look or or for the ones who missed it, be able to see it. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm one of your fans. I've seen you play at Preservation Hall a number of times. Uh, I think you're a fine trumpeter. Oh, thank you. Appreciate All right. Great. Oh. Got another little freeze going. Oh, I, right. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I, I'm moving locations because maybe it's my <laughs> my five signals. So yeah, we're, we're well, we're wrapping up anyway. But she she just said right. that you were a fine player and and uh, was complimenting you on that. So um, any, if there are no other 
questions or comments, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. And uh, thanks for anybody who bought donation tickets. Uh, those donation tickets help us offset the costs of these things and help us keep, keep it rolling. And as I like to say, I'm herding cats. I'm still uh, working on the May, the May uh, speaker. Um, it's, uh, it's entertaining sometimes trying to schedule musicians to do talks. But, <laughs> you know, if there's a gig, the gig takes priority and a lot of a lot of folks won't commit until like really close to the deadline date. So anyway, I will uh, once I know who's talking in May, I will get that information around. So look for that for any of you who are uh, following us. You can follow us on Eventbrite or Facebook or go to our website, which are, which is prjc.org for potomacriverjazzclub.org. All right, folks, thanks so much. Mark, thank you so much for sharing your uh, stories and your time with us. We appreciate you. Yeah, it was, this was fun. Great. And uh, I'll see you in New Orleans at some point. <laughs> that sounds like a winner. All right. Good evening, everybody. Have a good night. Good evening. See y'all later. I'll Bye. See you in a couple weeks. Right. Okay. Sounds good. Bye, baby.